not sure which one. Broadman, old Broadman with the shape notes and all of that. Hey, I'm telling you, man, the Lord knows how to inspire worship, doesn't he, in adoration. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Because yeah, yeah. sometimes it does take grace to trust him. Now, I'm serious because he'll carry you through some stuff that doesn't seem to be like, where are we going? And what are we doing? How many of you have ever been confused by where you find yourself, huh? Come on, how many of you will admit it? I guarantee you. I'm probably in it right now, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I've been in it for about the past 11 years. Uh, you know, it's, uh, sometimes people ask you, well, how's it going, Pastor? And I say, well, <laughs> it depends on what day it is, you know. I mean, some days I'm triumphant and victorious and believing and faith-filled and championing and all of that. And then there are other days where I really won't tell you, actually, because it's really a, it's like you don't really want to know. <laughs> That's not, you really don't want to know. And uh, I just have this sneaking suspicion. The re reason I'm able to confess this to you is because I have the sneaking suspicion that you are like me yeah. and that uh, we're all in the same boat together, right? Yeah, some days I'm victorious. Some days I'm faithful. Some days I'm triumphant. Some days I'm Dr. Keith Thrash, soldier of Jesus Christ, and, you know, boom. And then some days it's like, you know, oh, God, do you love me anymore? You know. Ooh, it takes grace to trust him more. It does, man. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And that's what chapter 7 is all about in the book of Revelation. I'm sure that all of you have read chapter 7 in this week leading up. Do any of you read the book of Revelation before you come? You know, like during the week, you say, let me see what's coming and so I can kind of get fired up and ready for whatever's going to come. Do you do this? If you don't do this, let me just encourage you to do this. Because, uh, you know, it'd be a good thing that the Lord could speak to you about some things that are there uh, before you even come to church. Because I want you to know that God intends for you to understand this book. This book is not called the book of closure. You know, it's called the book of Revelation. Revelation means to be revealed, not to be, not to be covered, you know, not to be secreted away, not, not to be interpreted by only a few special people, and you have to have some kind of theology degree to make sense of this book. He did not write this book to confuse you or to keep you in the dark. He wrote the book to open it up to you, to expose you. And I believe in these days that we're living in right now where every day we get closer and closer, obviously, to some cataclysmic events. And I know you see it. I know, I know you, you, you just can't, unless you live in some bubble somewhere where you never see any of the news, you never hear anything, any news from any source or, or, or interact with the world in any way outside your little tiny bubble that you might live in. Um, you have to sense that all the craziness that's going on is not going to be able to continue. I mean, the lunacy of the day we live in, all the anarchy, all the lawlessness, that stuff can't keep on. I mean, it's going somewhere and it's got to end. I know, you know, I guarantee you, you watch on TV and there's this group and that group and everybody's a victim and everybody's being whipped up and stirred up and, you know, show up over here and protest America and, you know, go over here and, 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 and make, get in somebody's face and make them ashamed that they're a part of blah, blah, what Lawlessness, just, yeah. you know, just lawlessness. Let's kill us a police officer or two in cold blood for no reason, sitting in their, sitting in their cruisers somewhere. You know, I mean, come on, What? Let's drive down the street and shoot somebody. Who? Who? Well, it doesn't matter. Let's start shooting somebody. I mean, lawlessness. Just, just tyranny. Just anarchy. Well, you can't keep on with that. It's, got, it's going somewhere. And, I, and I'm just telling you, the book of Revelation is about these kind of things. I mean, there, it's saying, this is what's happening now. And it has, a, it has a progression, and here's what's going to happen as soon as certain uh, heavenly things are, are, are in place, and God is in control of these heavenly things, and God has a purpose, and God is leading us down a path, and it's carrying us somewhere. And as uh, seals are opened in heaven by the Lamb, who is the only one worthy, and who is the Lamb in heaven? Jesus, the Lamb of God. 
He's the only one found worthy. You remember these things, right? Chapter 4. And uh, finally, he's found worthy, and uh, then he begins to break seals, and when he breaks the first one, a white horse comes out, and it's a spirit that's put on this earth, is loosed on this earth, and it, and it, and it takes, uh, it takes uh, tyranny, and I mean, uh, uh, anarchy, and uh, this spirit of delusion to new heights and new levels, and then another seal's broken and a red horse comes forth and it brings terrorism and releases it just in, in, and r- removes the restraint off of whatever go- is going now. And you think it's bad now and you wait until the red horse comes forth and then the third seal is broken and it's a black horse and the black horse carries with it a, a famine and a bread has gone up and inflation has gone up. I mean, it's like you have to work a whole day and you can only buy enough food to keep you alive for a day. Not your whole family, not, not your mother-in-law and your granny and all them. We're not talking about paying a house note, paying a car note, your cable bill and all of that kind of stuff. We're talking about you work all day to get enough food to keep you alive for one day. Oh, terrible times, terrible things going on. And then a fourth seal is broken and a, and a green cadaverous colored, the book calls it a pale color horse comes forth and man, it has all kind of diseases and pestilences and, and wild animals uh, killing people and all of this kind of stuff and it's just a horrible thing that happens. And then the fifth seal is broken. You remember the fifth seal, I hope when I say it, you'll say, oh yeah, yeah. The fifth seal, we're introduced to some martyrs What is a martyr, by the way? A martyr is somebody who has given their life for the Lord. Somebody who's been killed because of their association with Christ. It is assumed that once you give your heart to Christ, you begin to live for Christ. Whether you're saved on this side of the rapture, which is the great upgathering of Christ and all the people, you know, which we're waiting on, by the way, or whether you're saved on the other side after a tribulation period begins on this earth. I know some of you might be surprised to find that there will be some people that are saved. It's going, to be, it's going to be millions of people saved. It's going to be, the tribulation time is going to be a time of great revival on this earth. Now, it's going to be tough to be revived because once you get revived, you become an enemy of the Antichrist and the state. And believe me, he's not going to take kindly to you. And if you think Christians have it bad now because people talk about us, boy, you're going to be hunted down like a dog. You're going to be, you're going to be chased over the hillsides. You're, going to be, you're, going to, you're not going to be able to meet like this. Man, if you meet like this, the government will come in the door and just pff, wipe everybody out because you're an enemy of the state. You stand in the way of the control of, a, of an anti-Christ spirit that's going to be ruling the world. So I've heard people say, you know, hey, I'm going to, be, I'm going to, I'm going to wait until all this rapture stuff and happens so I can make sure that the Bible is right. Because I, I don't know if anybody in this house today would be speculating as to whether the Bible knows what it's talking about. You know, you might be in here and say, well, you know, I've been hearing that all my life and I don't really know if I believe all of that kind of stuff. You know, you might be teetering like that. You might, you might, you might come to the conclusion, well, you know, I don't really, I mean, I, I, I've heard it and it makes a little sense to me and I know, you know, I believe in God and I believe he's in control, but I don't know if all of this stuff, these preachers preaching about and all this rapture and all this calling away and then tribulation, I don't know if all that stuff is true, so... I'm just, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to hang around and then if, if I wake up one day and granny's gone and mama's gone and the babies are gone and you know, I'm in the house by myself and I'm looking around and, and then I walk out in the street and all the neighbors are looking for their granny and their mama and their babies and they, you know, it's like, what happened? I, and then uh, these people are just, boom, gone off the earth. Uh, then I'll know. Hey, man, I'm tell you, then I'll know. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fall on my knees right there in the middle of the street, and I'm going to say, Jesus, all that stuff they said was true, and I, I want you, and I want you, and I, you know, come into my life and save my soul. Oh, my goodness. And that's what you're thinking you're going to do. But let me just tell you two things that prove you're not going to do that. Number one, the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says you're not going to do it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says what's going to happen to you 
is you're going to be lied to. Oh, yeah. There, what kind of explanation do you think the Antichrist is going to have for something like that? Well, I mean, look, look right now. You can look on some of these goofy networks, depending on what flavor you are, your, your network flavor, whichever one it is, and you, you, they'll have, they'll have, you know what they'll do? They'll convene like five or six people on a panel discussion. I mean, as soon as it happens, there'll be a panel on some of these shows and it'll be like the first one will say, well, what do you think happened in it? Well, uh, you know, uh, the Russians have been developing this new strategy. By the way, have you heard in the past couple of weeks that uh, they think the Russians have uh, created some kind of radiation machine that radiated some of the diplomats down in Cuba and hurt their ear in and caused brain damage and stuff? I don't know if you've heard that or not, but I heard that this week. I, you know, I don't know whether that's, I have no idea whether I'm not in the CIA, FBI, or any of the other alphabetized uh, agencies in this world, but... You know, that, that, stuff like that could be the explanation. Well, you know, what really happened, Jim, and, you know, is uh, the Russians have finally developed their, uh, uh, their invisible machine, and they have uh, shot radiation into the atmosphere, and uh, it has interacted with the molecules of certain bodies, and those bodies have just uh, vanished. Mm. What do you think, Susie? Well, you know, I don't know this stuff about UFOs. You know, there have been people been sighting these UFOs for years and years and years. You know, it could be the UFOs have come and gotten them. You know, have you, just, just a little side note. I, I'm, it's always interested me, the people who see these UFOs. Have, have, they, have they been interesting to you? Why is it that only, uh, you know, Boudreaux and Bistro and, and, and Bubba see these things? I mean, seriously, it's like, when, have you seen the interviews? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to interview the man on the street. that has seen one of these. Uh, yeah, I mean, Bub, he doesn't have any teeth, you know. And he, uh, yeah, we seen them, and you know what we said to him? We said, come over here, little buddy. And, you know, uh, yeah, that's right. You know, we'd take you bowling if you had more fingers, you know. And, um, and no, wonder, no wonder they don't come back. I mean, you know, really, it'd be like, It'd be like, man, if those were the people you met and you thought everybody was like that, you'd say, hey, pfft, let's put a sign on this planet that said, don't even stop there for gas. I mean, <laughs> you don't want to stop on that planet because those people are weird, you know, in there, yeah. But anyway, that could be the explanation for it. There will be a lot of different ways of trying to convince people what happened with all these people that are suddenly gone. And because you heard the truth on this side of that event... 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says you're not going to have another chance. You are going to believe the lie because God is going to send you strong delusion. Not the devil's going to trick you, but God is going to send in your mind strong delusion. I've already, I mean, have, these panels that you're watching are full of delusion right now. I mean, <laughs> it's like, what world do you live in? Uh, you know, uh, the truth, you're not restrained by the truth, obviously, you know, I mean, <laughs> what you're saying, you know, is not true, but hey, that doesn't matter because it, it's just what you think is important. Well, that kind of spirit is going to be just rampant. It's going to be just delusion everywhere. So I'm just telling you, you're not going to fall on your knees and ask Jesus to come in your heart because you're not going to believe what happened happened. You're going to be deluded. And then the second reason I don't think you're going to do this is because if you don't have enough courage and character and fortitude right now where there is no persecution, where nobody's going to kill you and cut off your head and burn you at the stake and feed you to the lions and torture you, if you don't have enough courage and honor right now to step forth in a service where everybody in here is rooting for you to do that, everybody be happy if you do that, you are in a pleasant atmosphere where everybody in here would be just so encouraged if you would do that. If you're not going to do it in this kind of atmosphere, I doubt very seriously that you're going to have enough courage to stand up for Christ when it means you're getting a bullet between your eyes. They're going to hang you up on some tree somewhere. They're going to burn you. They're going to waterboard you. They're going to do all kind of torturous and horrible things to you. Yeah, I don't convince me that you're going to be that strong and courageous. Yeah, right, right. 
But there are going to be some people that are saved. And the breaking of the fifth seal gives us a view of a whole bunch of people that, that John says are underneath an altar which is in heaven. In other words, like the Old Testament altar, you've heard of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the, the moving sanctuary that went with Moses and the children of Israel, where God gives the design for every furniture, every curtain, every bar everything, and God says, do it like I show it to you. Don't make one alteration. Don't make it one centimeter longer or one quarter of an inch less. Do it exactly like I said. And it is that heavenly sanctuary, that, those heavenly pieces of furniture, a brazen altar outside in the people's, when the people came in to the, to the courtyard, uh, they came through a gate and the first piece of furniture that they had to go to was a big brass altar that stood up and had horns and you hung your sacrifice and confessed the sins of your family. And the, and the blood dripped down on the coals down here and the smoke went up. And if God's nostrils breathed it in, like the smoke going straight up, and then all of a sudden it goes and sucks into God, okay, great, your whole family is, is delivered for a neck for a whole year. It means God accepted your sacrifice. It meant everybody told the truth. It meant, you know, your little crazy uh, grandson who's been looking at pornography admitted it, and, you know, he really did it. Uh, if somebody left a few details out, then the smoke just kept going up and God didn't receive it. And then, and then it's, uh-oh. And dad had to go back outside and get his family together and say, which one of you hadn't told everything? And you've lied or you've held, held back something. And man, you go to the back of the line, which means you're probably not going to make it back. And it means you're going to not be with Israel anymore. You're going to be out in the desert by yourself. No, no people, no food, no blessing, no anything. You just signed your family's death warrant is what you just did. The altar, that's the altar. Then you go inside a little room and there's a table of showbread and there's an altar of incense and holy man, it's just... Mm. Anyway, that's the, the furniture, the furnishings. Well, under this altar, there are people that are seen that are, that are praying a prayer. And what they're praying is, Lord, how long is this going to be happening before you avenge our blood? This is not a graceful prayer. This is a vengeance prayer. This is not a prayer of people praying, Lord, please forgive them, and Lord, save their souls, and Lord, do something merciful. Like we pray right now. You know why? Because we're in the age of grace right now. We're in the age where we pray for forgiveness and grace and mercy because the Holy Spirit is ministering that. Now, once we're gone, oh, hey, the age of grace is over. It doesn't mean people can't, people can't get saved, but it means, boy, it's going to be difficult, and it's not going to be the same spirit around. And when they start praying under that altar, they're saying, God, when are you going to kill them? God, when are you going to avenge our blood? When are you going to get them back? When are they going to get their comeuppance, God? And it's like God said, hold on, wait just a minute, because there's going to be a bunch of people just like you that are killed during the tribulation period, and I'm going to wait until everybody gets killed that gets killed, and they get up here with you, and then I'm going to start wreaking vengeance on the earth. But just hang on, just hang on. It's coming, it's coming. Well, you might have been a little bit interested. And then the sixth seal, remember last week, chapter six, the sixth seal is broken, and you got all of these uh, big people of the earth. You got the kings, the captains, the chief counsels, the free men, the slaves. You got all these people, seven groups of humanity, that run to the mountains and start saying, oh, fall on us because we, <laughs> we want to escape the wrath of the Lamb. And they try to die and kill themselves, and they can't die, and they can't kill themselves. Uh, whew. Good days. Uh, yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, it sounds like fun to me. I'm telling you, I've heard people say, well, I'm just going to die and go to hell and party with my friends. Yeah, 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 that's what you're going to do. You keep on believing that. Yeah, yeah, you're going to be sitting down there hope, wishing you could die, being tortured every moment of your existence. Yeah, yeah, that's what the devil wants you to believe, some silly, foolish mess like that. Oh, no, oh, no. Well, but anyway, so in chapter 7, we have this giant parenthesis. How many of you have ever been telling the story and you're carrying the story through and then you get to a certain point and, you, and it comes, dawns on you that they might not know what you're talking about. And then you stop and you say, wait, 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 wait. Before I go on, you need to know this. 
And it's like a big parenthesis in the story that you're telling because you think they need some information that they don't have so they can appreciate the rest of the story. So chapter se- and there's several of these kind of things that happen in the book of Revelation. They're big parentheses. All of chapter 7 is a big parenthesis. And chapter 7 tells you who these people are that are under this altar. It's like John just talks about a multitude of martyrs that are under an altar in heaven, and, you, and then he just goes on. And, and, now, and now John says, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, wait, you might be interested in who these, all, who these people are under there, and where did they come from? And so chapter 7 doesn't move the action along. It just kind of pauses us a second and says, okay, let me tell you about these people under the altar, where, who they are, where they came from, how they came to believe in Christ after, after the, the Christians are gone off this earth and the Holy Spirit's been left. How did that happen? And who are these people and what is God's plan? Because look at your neighbor and say, God is still in control. Yeah, say that. God is still in control. I don't care what period of time we're talking about, God is always in control. And what this book of Revelation teaches us is that God has a plan and it's all working according to God's plan. And no matter how evil and wretched and powerful the devil thinks he is, he is still a puppet in the hand of God. God is still pulling his chain. God has him on a leash and just leads him around like a little sick hound all the way through. And every time God, you know, wants to, he can just blast him and show him just how weak he is and how puny he is and how he can't win. And chapter 7 introduces us to two sets of people that are intended to be a slap in the devil's face to say, I don't care how big shot you think you are. I don't care how much control you think you have. I don't care what it might look like on this earth. You, buddy, are not in control. And I'm going to use two groups of people to just smack you upside the head and say, look at this. You can't even affect this, which means you're not going to win. If you can't do anything to these, you certainly can't win the battle. And, and he just humiliates the devil with these people. And I just want you to see them and in chapter 7. Let me just read the verses. And then we'll just kind of go back. Now, I want to show you three little things in this, in this chapter. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Interesting little concept, right? You know, north, east, south, west. Four points of the compass, uh, maybe one on the north. These are like angels that God uses to control what's going to happen on earth. Holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or any tree. By the way, if you want to know, uh, it, when the trumpets start sounding, the first thing that starts happening is the earth and the seas and the trees are blown up. <laughs> but, but God in the seventh chapter said, okay, wait, wait, don't do anything yet. Hang on, whoa, whoa. Wait, the trumpet hadn't sounded now. All right, hold it back. Don't let anything happen. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east. Well, let's have something to say about that in a second. Having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, uh, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Now, this is verses 5 through 8. It says the same phrase over and over, and I just kind of put all the names, but it says the same phrase over and over. But of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000, Gad, 12,000, Asher, 12,000, Naphtali, 12,000, Manasseh, 12,000, Simeon, 12,000, Levi, 12,000, Issachar, uh, 12,000, and Zebulun, 12,000. So there are 12,000 from 12 tribes of Israel. 12,000 times 12 is how much? 144,000. So 144,000 Jewish people. Everybody say Jews. Jews. These are from the tribes of Israel. These are not Jehovah Witnesses. We have a whole denomination built on the fact that they think they're the 144,000. <laughs> How goofy is that? 
I mean, these people are clearly taking 12,000 from 12 tribes of Israel. If you're not from a tribe in Israel, you're not one of these. Doesn't say 144,000 goofy Jehovah Witnesses are sealed. No, it's 12,000 Jews. Not Gentiles, but Jews. These are not followers of David Koresh or Jim Jones or any other wacky Messiah figure that's ever lived on this earth. God chose it. Do you know that the Jews themselves don't even know what tribe they're from? Are you aware of this? All the records were lost. When Titus, the Roman general in 70 AD, sacked Jerusalem and didn't leave one stone left upon another and tore the whole temple down, all the records were lost of who belonged to what tribe. And right now, you can't go to a Jewish person and say, Brother, what tribe are you from? And he might say, Well, my last name is Levi, so I'm assuming I'm from the tribe of Levi. Well, you might assume that, but you don't know that for sure because none of them know what tribe they're from. God knows. God said, I got 12,000 from all 12 tribes. He knows who belongs what tribe and everything else. God, God has a place for us all. Listen, God knows everything about us. Holy, holy, holy. And so he, do, he takes these 12,000 from tribe, and they were crying. And, and, and after these things, I looked, and behold, great multitude, which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And they were crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. There's that one I was telling you about. The angel, Amen. <laughs> Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's what the angels were doing. And those elders that are always in the presence presence of God. Amen. Let it be. Let it be. Notice what they did. And, and, those, and they fell on their faces before the throne and they did what? And they worshiped. Now, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill. And I'm not really saying that it matters one way or another, but there is a difference between praise and worship. Praise is bragging on Jesus, bragging on God. So when you say something that brags on him, you're the greatest, you're the best, you're the mighty one, you're the alpha, you're, I mean, you're, you're bragging on him for being who, you're the bright and morning star, the lily of the, of the rules of your, you're bragging on him, you're, pra you're praising him. Worship means you tell him why he deserves your praise. Worship means worth-ship. It means why is he worth praising and they worshiped him because blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor belong to him. That's why you're worth, worth praising because you own all of this stuff and you give it to us and we have this spirit and this nature because you gave it to us. So you're worth our worship. I just thought I might, you know, call your attention to that. Amen. Blessing and glory and forever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered it saying to me, the elder jumps off of one of his thrones, comes over there to John and says, who are these arrayed in this white robe and where did they come from? I guess he didn't really want John to miss the fact that these, these were, you know, kind of unique people. And he just jumps over there and he said, hey, hey, John, where did all these people come from? And what did John say? And I said to him, sir, you know. In other words, I don't have a clue where they came from, but I know you know where they came from. So you tell me. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell with them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Whoo! Amen. That's the seventh chapter. Yeah, that deserves a glory to God. 
I'm telling you, man. And God will wipe, wipe away all tears from their eyes. Oh, man, yeah, that's a, wonderful, that's a wonderful word from God, a very comforting thing. All right, three things about this chapter quickly. I know, you know, time is fleeting as it always is, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the clock a little bit, so relax, all right? All right, number one. Uh, restraining angels. These first three verses, look, I'm going to just cut, touch these for you. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. You know, these fours in Revelation or something, you see them quite often. And as a matter of fact, you know, there were four creatures flying around the throne. You remember those? Living creatures, and they had four faces, you know, one like an ox, one like a man, uh, one like a, 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 what was it, an eagle, and one like a, uh, I'm missing one, a calf, an ox, an ox, a man, a calf, I mean, a, an eagle, and a lion, lion. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Just, I'm just testing you to see if you pay attention. You pass the test. Thank you, Lord. But anyway, four faces, four living creatures. Uh, these are heavenly creatures. Uh, four is the number of the earth, by the way. I don't know if you're aware of this. In scriptural numerics, when you see the number four, it makes you, it's talk, it starts talking about earthly things. Well, now there are four angels that are posted around the earth to hold back destruction that is set to go forth on the earth. And God says to these four angels that have been given the charge of holding back this destruction until God says, uh, okay, boy, boys, let her go. And they're standing there and God says, uh, all right, guys, whoa, 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 don't let the wind blow. Wind is always symbolic of destruction on this earth. You read in the Old Testament lots of passages and when it talks about a great wind and all of this, it's always blowing something up and turning things and scattering things and mutilating things and so forth. So there's a big destruction and these angels are you know, holding it back. And, and then I saw another angel, so a fifth angel enters into the picture and he's coming out of the east. Now, just so you'll know, I mean, it, 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 you know, this isn't going to take you to heaven, and don't, you know, try to get, when you get to heaven, don't try to use this as a pass to get in. But, uh, but this East thing is, is one of the themes of the return of Christ. Uh, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is telling what the signs of his coming is going to be. And then he gets all the way down to about verse 27, and he says, um, as lightning flies out of the east to the west, so will the Son of Man also come from the east. Now, I can't remember what song it is. Maybe some of you older guys and ladies will know, but there was an old song in one of the lines that just popped in my mind. It says, uh, keep your eyes upon the eastern sky. Lift up your head. Redemption draweth nigh. What? I don't know. Uh, keep your eyes upon the eastern skies. Lift up your head. Redemption draws nigh. Something in that symbolism. <laughs> but I, what I'm just saying is that many people have been in church a long time. You've heard this eastern thing. You've heard, okay, keep your eyes on the eastern skies because that's where he's coming from, the east. And here's it comes this angel out of the east, you know, and this angel is, you know, carrying some commands and. And he, and, he, and he must be like a powerful angel because he's, he's telling these other ones what to do. And, and he says, whoa, boys, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, keep this destruction back because I got to seal some people. Now you say, what is this seal? Well, this seal, you know what a seal is? A seal is like, you know, a, 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 little, a little stamp that uh, it's, you, you put down some, you put down like a, 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 a plastic-like substance or a little uh, candle wax or something in that kind of a format, and then you take that seal that has, you know, the emblem of the, of the person or whatever, and you stamp it down in there, and you, when you look at it, you can see, and if anybody breaks the seal, then you can tell, uh-oh, somebody's violated this thing, you know, and so God has a seal, now, I'm thinking that it's invisible. I mean, I'm, I'm not thinking that, you know, you, you're going to have, you know, genuine God right there in the middle of their forehead. But it's evidently something that angels can see and demons can see. Maybe, maybe people can't see it, but the demons know, uh-uh, can't touch that one, uh, because he's got the seal. Now, just to show you that God does this kind of stuff, just to reflect back in the Bible, reflect back. You remember when God was going to destroy the earth in the book of Genesis because everybody had gotten so wicked? You remember this? And then this guy named Noah was commanded to build an ark uh, thousands of miles away from any water. You've heard of him? Shake your head. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Okay, just want to make sure you remember who I'm talking about. All right. 
Noah, old man Noah, building an ark in his front yard, thousands of miles away from water or anywhere, and everybody comes by mocking him for 100 years, you know, and say 120 years, actually, and says, what's he doing up there and uh, building a boat? Uh, what's a boat, you know? <laughs> well, he says it's going to rain. Uh, what's rain? <laughs> Never had rain on the earth at that time. He's building this boat thousands of miles away from on water. How, what, what's the deal here? And Noah said, God's going to destroy the earth. Come get on my boat with me. And, um, and uh, uh, they call it an ark. You know why? Because the word ark means a box for safekeeping. So the ark was a box for safekeeping. It kept Noah and his family alive, bobbing up like a cork when the, when the, when the Lord flooded the whole place. But what my, my point is, God would not... How long did he build on this boat? 120 years. Why? What? I mean, that's a long time to plan ahead, right? But what you need to know from that is until Noah got on the boat, God didn't send the flood. He said, whoop, 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 can't send the flood till the boat gets finished. I'm just saying it's in the nature of God to postpone things until something happens with one of his on earth that he's going to save, that he's going he's to he's use. God chooses people he's going to use and he, and he keeps them safe. And then sudden boom, God says, here, go right, loose it and let it go. Same thing happened in Genesis, uh, whoa, 29, is it 29? 19 or 29, one or the other. When God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities wicked as demons. And, and God said, hey, go get Lot out of there. Because I can't send this fire and brimstone down there and wipe those heathens out until Lot gets his self out of Sodom. What's he doing in Sodom anyway? So go get him. Get him out of there. And God waited until they went down and got Lot out of Sodom and then poof, fire started falling on the place. I'm just saying it's in God's nature to do things like this. And so God says, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Don't let any of those trumpets blow, guys. Hold back, all right? I know you're standing there, lips ready. You know, you're, you know you're, those angels, you know, they've got those trumpets, you know, and they're going to blow them one at a time, and then terrible stuff's going to start happening when they blow, just like when the seals are open, the, tr the trumpets are next, and it's going to be really bad. Uh, all these judgments and punishments get worse and worse as they go along. Hold up, guys. Don't blast on that trumpet. Angels, hold back the wind. Hold back the destruction because we got to seal 144,000 of these Jews before the trumpets start blowing and terrible things start happening on this earth. So right at the beginning of the tribulation period, I mean, in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, there are 144,000 Jewish people people that are saved to preach the gospel during this terrible time. Now, you know, how many of you are aware that Jews don't believe in Christ? Are you aware of this? I mean, one of the things that make Jews Jews is that they don't think their Messiah's come yet. They, they still do the things they did in the Old Testament with the sacrifices and the offerings and the arks and the, all that. And how many of you know we have some wacky Christians that think you can be a Jew and a Christian at the same time? Serious. There are groups of people meeting right now in churches. I'm serious. They're meeting in churches. And they're practicing Judaism while claiming to be a Christian. And I don't know. This is contrary to each other. It's diametrically opposed to each other. Whenever I make a sacrifice at an altar, I'm saying Jesus isn't good enough. I mean, come on. I don't know how you do it, but, I, you know, delusion. <laughs> there you go. Delusion. Idiocy. But anyway, but these Jews are going to believe in Christ. Just like another famous Jew that you know all about believed in Christ. His name was the Apostle Paul. How many of you have ever heard of the Apostle Paul? Nod at me, shake at me, wake up. Are you there? Okay. All right. The Apostle Paul was a Jew. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul had a famous reputation as being uh, the enforcer of Judaism. In Acts, the book of Acts, it says he went down the road breathing out threatenings and slaughter. In other words, Paul 
was like a fire-breathing dragon. That's the way he said. He said, you know what I was? I was a fire-breathing Jewish dragon that went to churches like this one right here, and I'd come in and I'd have an order from the king that anybody I found in this church worshiping Christ, I could stone them to death. And man, I loved my job, and I was good at my job, and I did my job with fervor and vitality. Buddy, I'd just find you. You were a dead man. And that's what the apostle Paul was by his own description. He went down the road, fire breathing, breathing out threatening. <laughs> you know, he was on his way. He had gone to the king and he said, there's a bunch of people at Damascus that are, that are Christians. And man, give me the orders so I can go down there and kill all those people. And the king said, okay, here you go. And Paul was on his way on the road to Damascus in his hand, the letters that gave him the permission to kill everybody like me and you. Do whatever he wanted to, feed us to the lions, you know, pierce us with arrows, burn us at the stake, hide us on a cross, stone us to death, whatever he, horrible way he might want to do it. And all of a sudden, it, the, uh, the Paul said, I was struck by this giant light from heaven. It knocked me off the back of my donkey. And he said, I was blind as a bat. And I looked up and I said, who are you, Lord? And he, in this voice, and this is the testimony of the people standing around him, because the verse says that all of his people that were standing around him and traveling with him, they, they heard the voice, but they couldn't see anybody. So it was this voice coming out of nothing, and he said, I'm Jesus who you persecute. And Saul said, what do you want me to do? <laughs> he said, get back on that donkey and go to a street that is called Straight, go to Straight Street. I thought, man, that is such a good street to live on. I'd love to live on Straight Street, wouldn't you? Go to Straight Street and somebody's going to see you there. They're going to know who you are and they're going to take you in. They're going to tell you what to do. He got back on that donkey, blind as a bat, couldn't see anything. Heard that voice, said, whatever you want me to do. I'm gonna. All of a sudden, he said, and then, and then Ananias got him. Not Ananias and Sapphira, okay. But Ananias, another guy named Ananias, got him, taught him what God wanted him to do, set him on the path, and he became the Apostle Paul that wrote 17 books of the New Testament, by the way. God used him in so many great ways. He was a Jew that came to Christ and became a flaming evangelist for Jesus. So 144,000 Apostle Pauls are going to be loosed on this earth. 144,000 are going to just go wherever they want to go, do whatever they want to do, and you can't touch them, devil. They're sealed in their forehead. They got a mark on them that says, you can't do anything to these guys. You can't torture them. You can't waterboard them. You can't feed them to the lines. You can't even put a scratch on their body. You can't do anything to these guys, devil. You know what that is? That is a slap in the devil's face to say, look, if you can't physically do any of these things physically, it means God is still in charge of this physical universe. It means I don't care how big shot you think you are, if you can't even touch these physically, you're going to lose the battle, buddy. And so as a testimony of God's power in a seven-year period of tribulation, these 144,000 Apostle Pauls are going to go everywhere holding revival meetings and preaching for Jesus and trying to win people to the Lord. And these guys under the altar are obviously are somebody that heard these guys preach and said, Oh, it's Jesus. Let me, get, let me come to Christ. Let me, right, buddy, if you do, you're going to die. I don't care. I don't want to be here anymore. Jesus is king, and you're going to have to give your life you know that. I mean, they're not going to touch me. They can shoot an arrow at me and it'll disintegrate before it touches me. I mean, God's got me sealed and they're not, the devil can't touch me. God's slapping the devil in the face and saying, if you can't even beat these guys, you have no physical power. If you can't beat these guys, you're not only not going to defeat them, you're not going to win this war, buddy. And then we're introduced to another bunch of people, a bunch, everybody say Gentiles. So we've met a bunch of Jews that get sealed, and then we meet a bunch of Gentiles that, uh, that are, uh, these are the soul winners, and it just names them. Let, let, me, let me stop back. I get, I get a little ahead of myself sometimes. Let me just hit this real quick. I got to go. 
All right, 144,000 from every tribe. The only thing I want you to see here, and for all you Bible scholars and all you uh, biblical historians that this matters to, uh, there are 12 tribes that are mentioned here. If, you're, if you know the tribes of Israel, you know that uh, there are two tribes that are missing, and then there are two tribes that have been added. Of the tribes of Israel, Joseph was not one of them because Joseph had been sent to Egypt to keep them alive. You remember this, Joseph, coat of many colors. Brothers sold him to the Midianites. Midianites sold him to the Egyptians. He, he was in the prison, and the king had a dream about some fat cows eating up, some skinny cows eating up some fat cows, and Joseph gave the interpretation and said there's going to be a famine that's going to last for seven years and blah, blah, and the king says, I'm going to put you in charge, and he builds these giant silos, and he, and he keeps everybody alive, and Israel has to come down there and get their grain, and Joseph, brother Joseph, that's brother Joseph, so, so he didn't get any land because he wasn't there, so he's not one of the original tribes. And then there was also another tribe not given any land. It was the tribe of Levi. The reason why is because Levi were the preachers. They were the priests. And so the Levites got no land as one of the 12 tribes because it was the other 11 tribes' responsibility to take care of the preachers and the ministers. So they didn't get any land and they weren't listed as one of the 12 tribes because they didn't get any land. But you will notice in this list, Levi is mentioned and Joseph is mentioned. There are two tribes that are not mentioned, and the two tribes that are not mentioned are Dan and, and Ephraim. And the reason Dan and Ephraim are not mentioned is because in the Old Testament, they followed idolatry. And, and so the assumption is that when the Antichrist rises, most likely the tribes of Dan, uh, 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 Dan and Ephraim would be part of the coalition, most likely, that would try to encourage the Jews to worship the Antichrist because they were an idolatrous lot in the Old Testament. They're probably still idolatrous now in the New Testament, and they'll fo follow that thing hook, line, and sinker. But I, I just wanted you to know if you're reading the list, you say, hey, where's Dan and where's Ephraim? And why does Joseph have some land, and why is Levi mentioned up there? I just want you to know that there is a difference in the list, and most likely that's the reason why. But it's 12,000 from all of them. Frankly, I don't, I don't care which tribes they use, uh, myself, uh, really. But, but the fact is he does it. Now, here are the Gentiles, and all the angels stood around the throne. And I'm going to finish up right here. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen! and blessing and glory and honor and thanksgiving and power and might be to the, our God forever. Uh, I put in your notes a little line. Uh, doesn't it, doesn't it um, excite you to, be, to cause other people to worship? I mean, you know, when, when something you say or something you do incites other people to worship God, doesn't that, doesn't that kind of get you excited? So imagine this. Here are, these, here are these people that are under this altar, and they begin to praise God, and they begin to thank God. And, and as they praise and thank God, uh, their praise and their, and their offering, uh, it, it causes such, a, uh, such a, a, an atmosphere of praise and adoration. And after these things, look, in a great multitude, which no one can number of all the nations and peoples and tongues, uh, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hand, which means they're clothed in white robes, which means their character is pure, and they're waving palm branches in their hands, which means they're victorious, you know, whenever. That's what that symbolizes. And they were crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what they were saying. These people were thanking God for his salvation, and they were praising God for his, uh, for his mercy and his grace. They weren't saying, uh, God, thank you that we were able to come out and we gave our life. For you. No, they said, we, Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy which belongs to you and praise to the lamb that sits on the throne. And then that causes such a stir, that voice and, that, and that, what they're saying causes such a stir that it causes the other ones around the throne to just fall out and worship and say, amen and glory to God. I just, I, why did God let us know this kind of stuff? I, I believe it is because he wants us to understand what happens in these days. And the fact that 
there are going to be some people that come to the Lord in these days, and we need to know that. And what's going to happen to them is they're going to face some, uh, some tough days, but God is still in control. Uh, the reason God saves a bunch of Gentiles is because there's another side of the battle that God needs the devil to know he can't win. You remember I said there are two groups of people that we meet in chapter 7. One are the 144,000 Jews that are sealed to preach the gospel. The other is this giant multitude of martyrs who give their life for the Lord. But where do we see them? Once they give their life to the Lord and then they're killed, where do they appear? They're in heaven with God. So they are meant to show the devil that, they, that he cannot win the spiritual battle. He can't win the physical battle because he can't touch these 144,000 and he can't win the spiritual battle because even though he was allowed to kill these people right here, their spirits still went to heaven because they trusted Christ as their Savior. So God wins every time. <laughs> he just wants you to know that, okay, and to know what's happening. So praise the Lord. All right, why don't you just... just...